<laughs> Questions? Just <laughs> say Um, I kind of have two questions quickly. Um, my first one is the last time uh, that it seems comprehensive immigration reform was attempted in some real way was back in the 80s under Reagan. Um, and it seemed then when he gave amnesty uh, to, you know, um, you know <coughs> to immigrants in the country at that point and, um, you know, to, uh, you know, made that, uh, made law that you can no longer hire undocumented workers. It seems like 20 years later we're back at the same point, right, arguing the same issues. And my question is, what do we do differently this time to make sure that actually um, the immigration reform lasts? And two, um, kind of go along with that, um, the last time this bill was discussed, you know, 2006, a lot of what was discussed was, for example, making uh, illegal immigrants go back to their home countries and then apply later to come to re-enter the United States. And you talked about some of these loopholes making individuals jump, th jump through so that the business community is comfortable with that. Um, it seems to me that if you make these loopholes too frequent or too many that individuals aren't going to do them and then you are left with the same issue we have today. So how do you kind of balance those two issues of making sure that it's comprehensive in actually enforcement and it actually works while also satisfying these communities that want those things to happen? Yeah, um, really good question. I'll take a crack and then. Um, the key, so I talked about three pillars of reform, right? An answer for the people already here, enforcement, and then a pipeline so that the workers we need in the future can come. That's the part that we left out in 86, was the pipeline for the future. We said legalize all the people already here, let's have some tough enforcement, but they forgot. They actually said they didn't forget. They said to each other in the back room, and you know, I've seen memos, we can lean the, the employers of their need for those workers. And the truth is they can't lean the you know, you know, I would argue, and I think economics shows, this isn't, our need for immigrant workers isn't about exploitation. It's not about their Americans who want to do it and we're keeping them out with low wages. It's that in 1960, half of all American men dropped out of high school and wanted to do unskilled work. Today, less than 10% of American men drop out of high school and want to do unskilled work. We just plain old don't have those workers. And two thirds of the computer science students in American universities um, are foreign born. So at both the top and the bottom, we really need the workers. If we pass a law that that's in denial about that, where we say, oh no, we'll lean them, you know, never mind, we'll find those farm workers somewhere, we'll find those computer scientists somewhere, we'll educate them really fast. What you have is people breaking the law. Um, you know, the, the American law, you know, and I'm, I'm, I believe strongly in law enforcement. I mean, I think enforcement has got to be a key part of this, but it's very hard for, the, for law to fight the dynamism of the world economy and the dynamism when we're not in recession of the American economy. But that's what we tried to do for 20 years with the 86 bill. We left out what I would argue is the heart of the bill. Future flows, at least it's for employers. It's not just for employers. It's for the, it's for the American economy. Future flow is for the American economy and for the workability of the bill. If you have a bill that remains in denial about those labor needs, it's not going to work. Enforcement is not going to work again. And in 20 years, we're going to have another big pool of undocumented people. Um, so terrific question, allows me to make my strongest case. <laughs> um, the hoops that we jump through, you know, I thought, again, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm talking a lot about Senator Schumer today because I'm very um, sort of taken with the way he's looking at this. But he said something really important in a speech that he gave um, a couple of weeks ago at Georgetown Law School, where he said, you know, stop calling them undocumented. Because when we call them undocumented, the people who are ticked that they broke the law think we're saying they didn't break the law. Now we can argue, and I do argue, that the law they broke was unrealistic and bad law and not in, you know, in sync with the reality, but the fact was, it's the law. And most of Americans in most realms of their lives obey the law and think it's kind of important. And they're insulted when we say they didn't break the law. So I don't think what's so important is that we, I don't think most Americans want to punish them. You know, I don't think most, they're undocumented, I don't think most Americans want to lock them up and throw away the key or make them suffer. But they do want to be, their basic sense that the law was broken, they want that kind of admitted and honored. So I think the key thing in, the, in, the, in the what we ask them to do, the key element of legalization is gonna be figuring out a way to say, you know, the law does mean something, and these people broke the law, let's get over it. But, but admit it as a way to get over it. And I think um, Senator Schumer understands that, and that's why I have a lot of hope for it. I mean, that's not gonna convince, you know, the Lou Dobbs of the world, but I think it's gonna convince a lot of the public that's upset by that piece you know, we follow the rules and we believe in the rules and here are people telling us, you know, the rules just don't matter. That bugs people. 
So I, I, I would echo, first of all, the, the Tamar's answer around future flow. I mean, what, in 86, there was no uh, acknowledgement of the immigrant tomorrow. So we have to figure that out. If we move a bill that does not create a viable future flow system, it is not worth the time. Uh, that's, it has to be done. In terms of the hoops, um, you were talking about the touchback, and in essence, require, uh, requiring anybody who wanted to legalize their status to go back uh, to their, their home country. I mean, that's a bailout for Greyhound. That's all that is. Um, I, I, I think what we have realized is that the public wants a practical, tough solution to the immigration system. So that for us, that means requiring the legalization of those folks who are here and undocumented. Um, and what I'm always surprised by is that so many people think that people are undocumented because they don't want to become legal um, or that you know, they haven't gone to the library to become a citizen. Uh, that is what a large part of the American public thinks, is that you can go to the library and become a citizen. Uh, so what we have realized is that, is that we need to take a hard stance and require that people get right with the law, with the law that has been changed to fit the reality of today. Uh, and once we do that, we, you know, we, we have the tax revenue from not only the individual, but the employer. They have the ability to, in essence, live above ground now. And then once they've met certain requirements, such as learning English, such as paying a, a penalty, then they get in line for citizenship. This is what the public wants, is a tough, practical solution. And what we've done is spend way too much time talking about silly solutions, such as touchbacks, or getting stuck in a political quagmire. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Mark Sheff from Workforce Management Magazine. And uh, you've all expressed optimism that immigration can be tackled this year. But Congress is going to go through a long, hot August on health care, and then a stressful September and October on health care. Energy is looming. Uh, with the uh, climate change bill in the Senate, don't you think that by the fall there's going to be big issue exhaustion on Capitol Hill? And secondly, are you learning anything from the health care debate, especially the one that's going to be going on here in August, that's um, uh, influencing the way that you're recommending immigration be approached? I think what we're learning from the health care debate, first and foremost, is that it's an issue of cost. So uh, by being able to present a solution that improves the fiscal reality of cities and towns by requiring the legalization of, of undocumented individuals addresses that issue of cost. I mean, do we want to stick with the status quo that spends $200 plus billion on detention deportation? Or do we want over $65 billion in revenue by requiring the legalization of individuals? There's a fiscal issue in that, uh, that the country is struggling with, and that's what we're seeing in, in the healthcare debate. Uh, in terms of the, the bandwidth uh, concern, you know, three months ago, we weren't even on the list of issues to be talked about in a serious way. We are now number three on the list. Healthcare gets resolved, energy gets resolved, immigration is up. When you have somebody like Senator Schumer, who is charging hard and says that he wants to move a bill that wins, uh, I mean, there's no turning back, Senator Schumer. Uh, you know, he's in this to win it. Uh, and it's our job as a coalition and as a campaign to support his leadership, to support the House, and to support the President to get to those votes. And to, to add to that, I mean, I haven't seen any sign of anything President Obama's ever done that he has sort of bandwidth restraint. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there to do. He, he goes for it. So I don't see any sign of, oh, kind of what's measurable, what's doable. Um, and I would argue, you know, I'm in the R in the room, I'm kind of the skeptic, you know, if, if healthcare doesn't work out quite the way um, the White House wants it, which, you know, I think it's fair to say it probably won't, um, immigration is something that I think they might want to turn to. I mean, you know, assuming it passes, but maybe not quite the whole loaf that they have been hoping for, um, immigration might be something to turn to. Now, I know, you know, to think of immigration as a safety tool is, um, is, is also, you know, kind of um, a sign of, you know, a lot of, a lot of ambition. But, you know, again, sh but, but Schumer is, Schumer is, is intent on this and thinks it's doable. Um, and that, and you know, Reid wants it done too. And um, there's, there are a lot of reasons, um, a lot of democratic reasons among others um, that people are gonna wanna move this this year. I'm just gonna add, can you hear me? Is this on? I just wanna add one thing to that. And if you can move the mic. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanna echo what Tamar said, which is that I think that 
Compared to climate change and health care, immigration, I think, was easy. I mean, the amount of the, the legislative options that are there are very narrow compared to the decisions that have to get made on climate change and health care. Climate change and health care affects much broader pieces of the overall American economy than immigration reform does. Uh, and frankly, there's a history yeah. on the issue. I mean, this is an issue that passed with 62 votes in a Republican Senate and had the backing of Reed, Pelosi, Bush, uh, and, uh, and McCain, and had a broad-based coalition from business to labor to immigration groups to uh, uh, evangelical uh, and Catholic uh, organizations. I mean, there is a, this is a broad-based uh, uh, effort that's been going on for years. There were some mistakes made. There were some unfortunate things that happened. That's what happens in legislation. We're seeing that play out on health care right now. It never turns out the way that you think. And I think the real test is going to be that, you know, can, can the Republicans come to the table in a meaningful way? Because, you know, what we're seeing with Sotomayor, for example, right now, is that the Republican Party isn't really interested in playing ball in anything. And what's astonishing to me, and this is the thing I don't quite understand because I was here in 1993 and 1994, and this actually feels nothing like 1993 and 94, because the longer the Republicans fight with Obama, the more their numbers go down. And if you look at the latest yearly Coast poll, for example, that's a weekly poll, the Republican congressional approval rating is now at 10% nationally. It's the lowest ever recorded in the history of polling, right? The Republican congressional leadership and party is more unpopular today than any political leadership in Congress in the last 70 years. And their numbers have actually gone down during this period of engagement with Obama. At some point, they're going to realize that the just say no strategy isn't really working. I mean, it may be taking Reid and Pelosi's numbers down a little bit. The Democratic numbers in Congress may be dropping a bit. Obama's numbers haven't really moved all that much. Their numbers have actually dropped more than either Obama or Reid and Pelosi. And, that, and at some point, I think they're going to have to figure out how they can become a get to yes party as opposed to a just say no party, because I think it isn't working. And if we continue to go down this road, I mean, there was a lot of evidence, you know, if you use FDR as the analogy, the Democrats actually gained seats in 1934, right? They didn't lose seats in 1934. And, and I think that the Republicans, I think, are really in danger. I mean, I, I, you know, the, the line I use in this is the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. And the, Republic, the country's become indifferent to the Republican Party. They don't even pay attention to them anymore in any meaningful way. And that what you're hearing from the Republicans today is the birther stuff, right? That's the thing that's dominating their message. And I hope the one thing we can all agree here today is that it's time to get Lou Dobbs off of CNN. Uh, and put him on Fox where he belongs, I think. Uh, you know, just like Glenn Beck. I mean, I think Glenn Beck has paved the trail for Lou Dobbs, uh, and I hope that we can see him go. And you, we have more questions. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I, my question is about the fine that immigrants have to pay, um, and will corporations that hired illegal immigrants have to pay a fine? And my other question is to uh, Ali, what do you think some of the compromises were that, um, I don't want to call it the center left, I'll call it people who can identify with the immigrant experience. What kind of compromises did that section of the activists have to make in this bill? Uh, I mean, first of all, in terms of the, the fine issue, uh, it's far too early to, to get into the details of uh, who pays what fine and what kind of fine. What we're saying as a campaign is that we realize that individuals in order to uh, legalize their status and to get onto the path of citizenship will have to pay some sort of fine. Um, and numbers, et cetera, are, are you know, the, that's the weeds, if you will. Um, I think in terms of the compromises. So even that there might be some people who can't afford the fine. Exactly, exactly. And that's why we're worried. It can't be $10,000, but it also can be $5. Um, how's that for a range? Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, your question about compromises, you know, the reason why we have crafted this campaign to focus on 279 votes is so that the compromises we have to make are the ones that will get us the votes. So as we move into August, I mean, let me put it to you this way. In June, we put together 44 local press events in 22 different states. We generated over 50,000 phone calls in less than two weeks. I mean, these kinds of numbers and this type of activity, not just from the immigrant community, but from a broad spectrum of stakeholders, shows members of Congress that there's a political 
um, incentive to being for a solution. So that at the end of the day, when we get into uh, the, the, the sausage making, and we do have to talk about compromise, we know what compromise brings what vote, and we know how that will get us to win. So I'm not trying to dodge the question, but you know, it's, we, 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 have, we have a long ways to go before we start talking compromise. And from my perspective, I don't want to compromise unless we get a vote. I see. I, I mean, at this point, um, you know, what we've heard from Schumer as well as others is that they're talking framework and they are talking about, um, you know, what what some parts of the bill can look like. We've nobody's seen anything on paper, so you know, we don't know if we've given away anything. Um, at the end of their hand, you know, we have to realize that if if it means that somebody else, you know, a potential opponent, is signing on endorsing that framework from the get-go, we have to grapple with that reality. You know, we're going to be. You know, very, very savvy and strategic about this process and about how we move forward. And you know, Senator Schumer is the guy, uh, and, and he's, he's, he's the person who can, who can uh, carve that path. I mean, just to think of it another way, I'm not going to answer about the compromise I was on the left, but again, you, know, you have to have business, labor, immigrant advocates, enforcement, hawks, all sign this, right? And they're all going to need to feel that they got something. So you know, to the degree you've got an those R and Andy enforcement hawks are going to have to feel this really is restoring the rule of law. Now, in a perfect system, that shouldn't take anything away from from immigrants, but you know, there'll be fears that it will. Business and labor, you know, we don't need to go into it. I mean, they're always the last. You know, we think we've finished the deal, and Lou Dobbs, you know, is the only one opponent. The business and labor are still at the table negotiating yeah. over the little fine print to get everybody to come. You know, to Find that sweet spot that everybody can kind of hold on to, and you know everybody's going to be hurting and holding their nose, but saying you know I'm getting just enough out of it that I'm sticking with it. It's, it's going to be like that, and you know I mean I agree with Simon. This is doable, but this is not going to be easy. <laughs> um, this is going to be a tough, hard fall where we're all going to have to work and be smart and be willing to know what we really need and what we're going to be willing to give up. But, but unlike healthcare, there really is starting place yeah. that everybody sort of understands. I mean, this is very different from healthcare and climate change. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's got to be created out of whole cloth, really in many ways. I'm sorry. Right? And created out of whole cloth is this. We're starting from sort of some piece of what used to be McCain-Kennedy, whichever part of that you hated or liked, right? <laughs> and uh, as a starting place where there's an orientation anyway, right, where everyone is coming. And that's why I think that for, as this thing gets deeper into the weeds, the number of potential options of where this goes is much more limited than what happened with climate change and healthcare. I, th I think there's just a clearer, you know, legislative path here than there were on these other two big, big things. I mean, there was a question. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the the business letter that you mentioned. Who signed it? Who sent? Uh, where yeah, it's not. It's um. It, it's we're we're sorry. That's why I'm less, I'm only paying half attention because we're wrangling over the last details. But it's um. The U.S. Chamber, the Central Worker Immigration Coalition, mm -hmm. which is uh, lesser skilled, Compete America, which is high tech, the Agriculture Immigration Coalition, which is agriculture, my organization, which is Grassroots Immigration Works USA, and probably a few others who are signing out at the last minute. But it's it's the array from high tech to to serve lesser skilled to agriculture. That's and where is it going to? Where? Where is it going to? Where, where is it going, going to? to? Uh, uh, prime targets addressees are the sub immigration subcommittee leadership uh, RMB, but but it should be the more widely. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, you think this should Thank be? Thank you. Out? You think this should be out today? Uh, probably tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, one of the interesting things I think has happened in the healthcare debate is uh, a couple weeks ago, when Center for American Progress, SEIU, and a couple of organizations came together and pressured Walmart, and Walmart came out and said, you know, we believe in the following things. Um, from a business perspective, and maybe you know other organizations in the landscape of, of immigrant um, reform, has that opportunity passed? Is there an opportunity for something like that to occur? Obviously, you know it's not going to be an identical situation, but is there the possibility for a large corporation um, or, or an organization that you haven't already partnered with to kind of come out and say, "This is what we believe, and we believe that this is important and needs to happen"? Yeah, well, there are um, large American corporations that are that are on record as. For immigration reform, right? Not nearly enough, but you know, from kind of Marriott, you know, Bill Marriott's been a great champion of immigration reform to Bill Gates, and you know, less people in between. We definitely could use more. We definitely could use more, and that's a lot of what we're working on. 
Um, Walmart, I kind of don't, I'm not sure we'll see that. But um, you know, I, th I, think, I think, I'm hoping that you will see um, some more brand name businesses before this is out, some more brand name businesses standing up. Have you spoken with the business perspective that you, you kind of focus more on, on people coming to America who have high skills or potential? Right, well that's a key part of the answer, right? Um, that's a key part of the answer. But I think what's happened is that even Microsoft or, or all these individual industries have said, yes, we have our stake, but we realize that our stake will be best served within the context of comprehensive immigration reform. So even though their, their interest is high tech, high skilled, they realize that the, the broader package of CIR is what will not only serve their needs, but the overall immigrant community's needs. Um, and you know, for example, on, on the forums board, you know, we have the, the Chamber of Commerce, the Landscaping Association. So um, the conversations between, in essence, the left center ca campaign um, and business have been very consistent. Um, and I think that we're going to see that as we get closer to legislation being you know, on the table, we'll see a closing of the ranks because any daylight between us will be exploited by the opposition. Yeah, this, this is not like health care reform. Yeah. I mean, this, is not, this doesn't look anything like health care reform. This passed with 62 votes in a Republican Senate. It had business and labor and immigration groups. I mean, th this has been an oasis. In the Bush years, this bill was actually an oasis of bipartisanship in a, in a, in a period where there was very little bipartisan activity on anything other than you know, the original war resolution and the original tax cuts, right? Yeah. When you go past that in the Bush era, there was very little bipartisan effort made on anything domestically. This was a successful effort led by McCain-Kennedy, an amazing duo. So one of the things that people who I think are getting sort of up to speed on this issue who haven't worked on it is this is not like these other issues. I mean, there has been a history of, you know, of incredible cooperation and a sense of a common national interest at play here, which hasn't really existed in some of these other issue areas. It doesn't mean we hold together, and, but it also means that this is not a third rail, right? This is, whoever used those words were mis grossly mischaracterized the nature of the public opinion about this, and frankly, the nature of the way that this issue played out in Congress itself. I mean, what other thing prior, to, imagine that John McCain, a year before he ran for president, uh, or 18 months before he ran for president, signed up a major piece of legislation with Ted Kennedy, you know, the greatest boogeyman of the right, right? I mean, that showed how much support he really felt there was at that point for this common sense solution, which is, why one of the things I just that we're trying to do in our briefings with staff and with members is to re, is to for them to recognize that yeah, 15 percent of the country is really adamantly against uh, immigration reform, and and is 15 those 15 percent, I'm sure, are also very unhappy with the racial transformation that's happening in the United States today. But 86 percent in that poll that I showed you at the beginning supported comprehensive immigration reform that is going to look an awful lot like what we end up with, right? It could be a, you know, a couple you know, words are a little bit different, but that's in essence where we're gonna be, 86%, right? That's more, it's way more than the public option, way more than anything else we put out there. And that's why I think, to Tamar's point, when Congress, Congress is gonna, if they feel like, hey, we didn't get as much done this year as we wanted, if we end up at that point in October, November, and they look around at what else can we do put more points on the board to show the American people that we came here, we got stuff done, we're moving on. This one is, is really teed up, I think. It's not gonna be easy, and a lot of work's gotta get done with the members of Congress who weren't here, and, and particularly the House, where there really has never been a serious debate about immigration reform. There's a lot of, I would argue, there's more ignorance than opposition. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think in the House people are adamantly against this. I think they just, they're worried and nervous, which is something that's a soluble problem, right? That's we can solve that problem and frankly, it's going to put a lot of, in, you know, it's going to require us to do a lot of just door to door sitting down with staffers and members and, bring, you know, do, having this same conversation with 150 House staffers and 120 to 150 House members in the next couple months. That's really where this campaign is beginning to move into now the hand to hand stuff, which is very time consuming. Uh, and, but I think the arguments, the facts are on our side in, in this case. Maybe one more, and then do you have anything? Yeah, Annabelle. Um, I have a question and a, I want to share my fear. <laughs> um, the c question is, I mean, why, has it, why did it fail in the past? You know, I would love to get your assessment of that. Like, can you isolate the factors? 
Um, and my fear is that um, this issue is going to get swift voted because, <laughs> right, there's going to be such a campaign of fear mongering and misinformation, and we know how effective they can be. That the, you know, even though mathematically we have the advantage right now, that they're going to have gain enough critical mass of scared people to stop this, which I think you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think happened in the past, yeah. right? And so how do we um, inoculate ourselves from that? You know, how do we counter that? I mean, that's sort of a general problem. How do we counter swift voting campaigns, right? Um, and, you know, having spent two years, you know, documenting the anti-immigrant lobbying in, at the local and the local and national groups uh, anti-lobbying uh, in Prince William County, I mean, we've seen over and over again politicians voting against their principles, right. best interests even of the county because they were afraid, <laughs> right? And so um, I just, I'm just afraid this is gonna play out again this year even though we have the numbers, we have the rational arguments that we are underestimating um, how irrational and susceptible to hysteria the American public can be, right? I think so in, in the past, the we... By the way, this is a great way to end. Okay. So let's use this as our final. Sure. Great question. Thank you. Uh, I think in 2006 and 2007, we as advocates were having a policy conversation while the rest of the country is having a political conversation. Um, and political, cut it through economic lens, cut it through a racial lens, but we were not, we ignored that, obviously, to, at, our own, at our own loss. Then we had 2008, where one million people naturalized as new citizens. Over a million people came to the, voter, came to the polls as first-time voters. So we began to realize that the political conversation was just as important, if not more important, than the policy conversation. And it, it comes down to you know, 44 electoral votes. Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Florida. That switched blue because of the immigrant and Latino vote. So I think politically we're stronger than we've ever been. But the hysteria will be there. I mean, I think that if we view the you know, hysteria, some of it, you know, a lot of it not based on fact, um, around healthcare as bad, I think what we'll see around immigration will be far worse. And the opposition has millions and millions and millions of dollars sitting and waiting to be spent on television ads. And they will go straight, to, they won't need Lou Dobbs, is what I'm afraid of. And we have to be ready to counter that because we've, we've always had good policy, now we have good politics, but we need to be able to counter their millions of dollars in paid media that they are just waiting to, to flip, on, flip the switch on. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have um, not contradictory answers, but actually different answers. I think that we failed last time around for two big reasons, both of which are actually fixable. And there were two times in the past, right, 06 and 07. We weren't actually that organized in the past, and there wasn't that much money spent. You know, the left was hardly, you know, the left was more organized than anybody, center left, but even they, you know, hardly any money. It was a few folks, field and center were not really together. Um, this time they were really organized. And I would say the same thing on the center right. I mean, we're not as organized as they are yet, don't have as much money, but, you know, people are taking this seriously now. Last time it was like a bunch of little guerrilla bands, you know, <laughs> trying to fight like a big national campaign. You know, compared to car check or healthcare or anything else, it wasn't even blips on the radar screen what we did last time around. And we're not going to be that organized or well funded this time, but we're going to be, we're a lot, it's a whole different universe. That's one thing we did wrong last time or didn't do. And the second thing was, you know, you, you can say the bill in 07 was a terrible bill, and in many ways it was a terrible bill, but, you know, basically we all said we were so preoccupied with what we didn't like about it that we didn't really come together around it. You know, that compromise that I think we need to, are going to need to do. And you could say that time we shouldn't have. We were right not to. But, you know, the other side in 07 was saying, you know, this is the worst thing that could happen to the country. And we were sort of saying, well, we'll hold our nose and hope it gets better. You know, it's like Coke and Pepsi. They're saying it's going to make you young and sexy and live forever. And the other company is saying we don't like the can, you know. I mean, so, you know, I think both better organization and are being willing to compromise. And again, I'm, I'm not saying we should have compromised around 07, but that's going to be very important. Um, on, your, on your swift mode, and again, you know, um, very useful caution, I would say. I mean, I think you're right. It's a real fear. Um, the one uh, thing I would, well, I would offer two things. I think, you know, um, 
some of that can be marginalized. Well, I think, that, let's, no, let's first say why it's scary. In the time of recession, there's going to be that tinderbox to throw a match on. It's going to be very easy to say to people, you know, I'm not even going to make the arguments here because I don't want to give them credence, but it's going to be an easy game to play. What we're going to have to do is make sure that people understand that, that is, the people aren't making a rational argument, that these are a bunch of real die-hard xenophobes that are playing to fears. You know, marginalize those bad guys and try to make clear that they're not making rational arguments about U.S. interests, um, which, you know, I think is potentially doable because they are a bunch of um, irrational people making, making with irrational fears that, that aren't really speaking to American interests. But I want to use one piece of evidence, which is that what happened at the state houses this year. So a lot of what my organization does, my coalitions in the states do, is they fight at the state level, bad immigration law. And in um, December, January, as we were waiting for the legislative sessions in the states to get started, we were terrified. We thought we were facing a bloodbath, that in the climate of the you know, skyrocketing unemployment, immigration was gonna, immigrants were going to be the scapegoat in every state house in America. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. Why? Because people were so concerned with the real problems that they had to deal with in states this year, like balancing the budget and trying to figure out how to you know, make do in the state economy, that, that, that scapegoating immigrants began to look like some kind of you know, luxury that some people have been playing with you know, in years when they didn't have a lot to do. And you know, it's, it's quite a comment on what goes on <laughs> in a lot of state houses, but there was no bloodbath. There were hardly serious attempts to pass legislation. There were no really bad bills this, this legislative session. And it's a, it's a tribute to the pragmatism. Um, you know, voters are in a, when, when American voters face real difficulty, I think they get pragmatic. And that's what we have to appeal to. This is a real problem. We need pragmatic solutions. Don't let those crazies, you know, scare you into, into taking your eye off the pragmatic issue. And I think I'll just add two quick ones, Annabelle, is that first, I do think that there is now a lot of evidence uh, that the scapegoating of immigrants doesn't work, right? I mean, if you look at the Republican primary in 2008 for president, you know, the guy who was most liberal on immigration uh, won the primary. And the guy, the two candidates most identified with the hardcore right, Duncan Hunter, and Tom Tancredo got combined 1% of the vote, right? So Tancredo never went above 1% in the, in the, even in a Republican primary audience, right? So first of all, I think one of the sort of the, the myths of this debate is that the Republican Party and its voters are adamantly against immigration reform. I don't believe that. I think that there is, they're split and that there is a, there is a wing like the McCain wing, which is the pragmatic, thoughtful, wants to solve a national problem, and then there's the demagogic wing of, of the Republicans. So part of what we have to do is to help empower the, ra the reasonable Republicans on this issue, give them more voice, give them more support, help bring them to the fore. Because if you look at the polling on this, and, and the last major poll where I saw where there was strong party numbers, and I haven't really looked at the Broadness poll, the LA Times poll from 18 months ago, was uh, the number was 62% support for comprehensive, 60% with Republicans, right? So it's not, it's not like the Republican Party, I mean, this is the argument that, that, I, you know, that I make with my colleagues, which is this is not like um, many other so-called wedge issues, which is the Republican Party is very split on this, and a lot of pieces of the Republican base, you know, business, high tech, you know, evangelical groups, Catholic church, who work a lot with Republicans are with us, right? This is not like abortion or gay rights. I mean, it's a very different dynamic. And, I, and it's why I think that the Republican, the, the problem that the, the anti-immigrant group is going to have is that when they pour the gasoline on the fire, there's no one else pouring gasoline on it either. There's no, there's no more gasoline to be poured because the rest of the Republican coalition isn't going to join in on this. And that's, that's not true where you see this sort of unanimity on, he on health care, for example. Health care, for example, so I think that the challenge strategically is to help Tamar and other Republicans who really want to do this right to give them more of a voice and to help liberate them perhaps from the other parts of their party. This, the second thing I'll just add to this is that I, I do think that, and, I, and this may get me in trouble with some of my friends in, in the White House for a second, but I, I think that what we have learned through Sotomayor, through Gates and the COP, and through the birther stuff and everything that's going on is that we're not in a post-racial America, but race as an issue is changing. And you know what race was throughout all of our history up until very recently was 
a white, black, overwhelming majority, overwhelming minority, and it was a pernicious and malevolent experience in our history. It was, an, it was the worst part of the American experience, uh, I think, going back to the founding of, of the country. What we have now as an opportunity as a country is to reinvent what race means. And, and I think that this is a battle that Barack Obama cannot sit on the sidelines on. And I have a feeling that, you know, if we are smart in what we do, uh, and if Sotomayor, if we spend two weeks lionizing this great wise Latina in the end of September and early October, the climate in the country will be right, I think, for this conversation after having gone through this experience of sort of seeing this remarkable woman ascend to the Supreme Court. Uh, and then for us to build upon that sentiment in the public and the pride that they have of a striving, I can't say immigrant, but a striving Puerto Ricania, right, to, uh, to, to go to the Supreme Court, then that becomes, I think, our opening to really to push. Because I do think that one of the great promises of the Obama age was this sense of, of moving to a, uh, for racial, racial reconciliation, where there was a sense that it's okay to feel good about people not like you. And I think the American people like that. I think that's who we are, actually. I think the founding principle of this country is, into is has, was tolerance. And I think the country is becoming more intolerant of intolerance. And I think this is going to be an incredible test. And it's why I think that when you listen to folks who've been with the president himself, he's really committed to this. And remember, he is a child of an immigrant. And when you listen to his own story, it is so tied up into this you know, sort of serendipitous event of his father coming into this country and, and everything else. And, and obviously, his birth in Hawaii, I have to just say that, right? And as a native-born American uh, that, that he is. Um, but I think, and it's why I think that, and Annabelle, getting to the final point I'll make on this, is that we also have to figure out how to be more comfortable with the moral dimension of this whole discussion. And I think that we have not done a good enough job in the center left, either in identifying this, in talking about race and racial transformation in ways that have a moral dimension, but also the issues that you've covered uh, in your documentary, but also that, that are coming to fore in 287G and everything else, which is the immigration detention system is a moral disgrace and outrage that has no place in 21st century America. And at some point, we have to be able to talk about this in a way that isn't uh, an afterthought. Because when I tell my friends who work at the Department of Justice, for example, now Democrats have gone in there, that do they, are they aware that it's okay, that right now it, it happens every day, or it can happen that people can knock on your door without a warrant, come into your house, arrest you as an American citizen, and throw you in a, in a, prison, in a detention center where you have no habeas corpus rights and you can sit there for three months. People don't believe me. I mean, these are people who work in the Department of Justice say that can't actually be happening today in the United States. It's happening all the time. And I think that at some point, Ali, you know, we, this is our job. It's not Tamar's job on this. We've got to figure out a way to, to, to provide voice to this in a way that doesn't sound like whiny, whiny liberals, right? I mean, this is something where we have to get comfortable that this is against American values and people will be outraged if they understood that we have our own version of jackbooted booted thugs in the United States uh, operating every day wantonly without, without any oversight. And, and I think that we can get there on this. So let me just say, let me end with that by saying thanks to my two colleagues here. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time together uh, in the next uh, hopefully six, maybe nine months. Uh, and we'll be working closely with all of you as well. So thank you for being here. Uh, I'm optimistic and, uh, and, and pragmatic, perhaps, uh, tomorrow that we can get this done. But we're going to need to uh, work hard, but I, I think we can get it done. Thanks, everybody, very much.